Welcome to the Stonebridge Community Church online worship service. Today you'll hear the Word of God read, the message from this weekend's in-person service, and two songs to guide you in worship. Thanks for joining us today. Good morning. Uh, my name is Ryan Jocelyn. I'm the director of Youth and Families here at Stonebridge Community Church. Some of you know that and seen me before, but maybe some of you haven't. Uh, this morning, we're going to continue our uh, sermon series, Our Stories, God's Stories, uh, where we have asked congregation members to provide a little bit of their story to see how God is speaking through them. Uh, and this morning, we're going to hear from Katie Curtis, who is a recent graduate from high school, uh, Santa Susana High School, here in Simi, and she has been in the youth program, the children's program here at Stonebridge. Um, and then afterwards, I'm going to have a little reflection sermon, read some scripture, and uh, it'll be a good time. So please listen. I'm Katie Curtis. I've grown up at Stonebridge Community Church my whole life. I just graduated high school, and I'm about to start college at California Lutheran University in the fall. As someone who's grown up in the church, there are certain values and principles that have been ingrained in me since I've been very small. And, you know, these include like kindness. A lot of the times in children's ministry, we learn about, you know, treat others the way you want to be treated, love your neighbor. And so that's something that I've grown up with. And as a result, that's really shaped the way that I am as a person. I always try to lead, you know, my life with kindness and, you know, to consider how other people you know, are feeling and what they may be experiencing. And so that's one way that's shaped me. And then as far as my faith goes, being surrounded by people that are very like strong and secure in their own faith. And, you know, these people are willing to answer questions and listen to me and guide me. That's really helped me to grow in my faith. You know, having these examples of people who are already really strong and secure. There was Pastor Cynthia uh, Purvis, who was always there to answer any questions that I have or give me any advice. Then there was our youth leaders like Andy Thompson and Mitch Seeley and Scott Haney, who are also always there to lend an ear and to you know use their experiences as you know being older and more mature to help. And then I'd even go to say go as far as to say that Olivia and I've known Ryan for a short time, but I'd say he's pretty influential and. I think that God is calling us to help those, to reach out to and to lift up those who are struggling. You know, in the present circumstances, there's a lot going on in the world. We're still making our way through the pandemic. And then there's, you know, the war in you with Ukraine and just overall division between people. And so there's a lot of people out there that are hurting. And I think that as Christians, I think God is calling us to do what we can to help alleviate some of this suffering that's in the world, because there's definitely a lot of it. And while a lot of these problems don't have quick or easy solutions, I think that there are ways that we, you know, as a community can use our talents to help, you know, better the situation. And then as far as uh, my generation and our connection with God, I think that uh, it's not necessarily different or new, but I think that there's this great connection with God over this shared desire for justice. I, you know, my generation, we're just coming into adulthood, so there's a lot, we're still trying to get our footing. But I've noticed that a lot of people my age are very much into the social justice. As some of you may know, I'm going to be attending Cal Lutheran in the fall, and there I'm going to be studying political science in hopes of one day going to law school and becoming a lawyer. And the reason why, or one of the reasons why uh, this is my plan is because it puts me in a position where I can you know, seek justice and give a voice to those that aren't able to you know, give a voice for themselves. I hope that using my position as a future lawyer, I can advocate for causes that don't necessarily have uh, as much support right now. So I'd like to potentially look into being an environmental lawyer where I can stand up for the environment and help, which is so important, um, and to help preserve it. And also, but I'm keeping my options open. So even if that means you know, I'm open to doing like 
public defense clinics and things like that, which would allow me to advocate for all sorts of different people that need that support. As for the future of the church, I think that to help seek justice and to give a voice to those that need it, I think that something that the church can do is to you know, connect with these different communities, like the disadvantaged, maybe the homeless, and to give them a platform to speak on what their needs are. And then maybe there's something that the church can do to help meet those needs. And I think that could be a really effective way to help provide a voice and also to establish some sort of fairness or equality in the process. I think that to listen to a community is so important because you can't really begin to understand the problem until you can hear their side of the story. Coming from a position that isn't, you know, part, if you're not a part of that community, it's difficult to fully understand what their struggles are and the reasoning behind why these struggles exist. And so in order to best meet those needs, you need to understand where they're coming from. And to do that, I think that the best way is to give them, you know, to reach out and to give them a platform where they can tell their side of the story so that we can gain a better understanding overall of what the situation is. And that can help uh, to come up with a solution or not necessarily a solution, but some course of action that can help better or alleviate the problem. Yeah, give it up for Katie. Uh, I want to start this morning uh, just with thanking Katie for taking the time to be interviewed and for sharing her story with us this week. Uh, it's exciting for me as a youth director because I've gotten to know Katie well over this past year and I get to see each week how God speaks and works through her. And this week, I was just so excited that you all got that chance too. Um, and if you paid close attention, you would have heard that she's been a part of Stonebridge Community Church her entire life. That's pretty cool. And if you, uh, and it not only just like been a part of it, she's been actively involved whether it's been part of the children's program or the youth program. She's also been serving on committees. It's awesome to see anyone be as involved in their community, uh, let alone someone who just graduated high school. During this interview, I had the privilege of being the one asking Katie questions, and it was incredibly inspiring for me just to hear her speak as she answered questions, relayed to me how she, uh, she sees God calling her in this world. I began to have two separate ideas danced together in my head during this process. The first was how it felt like the spirit was speaking through her so clearly. The passion that came through as she spoke about her faith and where God is calling her in this church, in this world, in her life, just felt convicting and encouraging for me. The second idea that came to mind was just how incredible it is to know that the people of this church came alongside her and guided her, helped her, and encouraged her as part of her journey to be who she is today. It reminds me of how we make vows during a child's baptism, that we promise to help the family and the child in this church. It also brings to mind the old adage that it takes a village to raise someone. So as I sat with Katie's words, it reminded me of how God teaches and guides us by speaking through others. And like I said, it seems so clear to me at the time and, and still now that God is communicating through Katie's words, her thoughts and passion. I could sense the way she felt God was calling her and the young people in our church and this generation. And in turn, it helped me to see where God is calling me now in this moment, reminding me of my own call to ministry. This is part of the joy of getting to teach and work with young students of our church every week. I get to see how God is moving this generation and, and uh, as a consequence, understand where God is leading us as a church, not just Stonebridge, but the Christian church at large. It's exciting, but I realized when considering this, how little we actually allow the youngest in our church to have a say in the direction of our church. In general, it seems young people are written off as too passionate, don't live in reality, don't have enough experience, or any other myriad of reasons. But if God is calling them, using them to speak to us, it would be wise of us to listen. 
And these ideas of God using us, speaking through us, guiding us, reminded me of one of the great stories in our faith tradition, the story of Pentecost. And it is kind of funny that we bring up Pentecost now after spending so much time in the book of Acts as a congregation these past few months. But Pentecost kicks off Acts in wild fashion. And the story reminds us deeply of the ways the Holy Spirit is tied intimately to our lives. So today, I invite you back to the beginning of this text, to a room full of Christ's disciples trying to figure out what's next now that the resurrected Jesus is no longer with them. So please listen for the word of the Lord this morning as I read from the second chapter of the book of Acts. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now, there were devout Jews from every people under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Fellow Jews and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven, heaven above and the signs on the earth below blood and fire and smoking mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Will you please pray with me? Holy God, we thank you for this opportunity to worship together this morning, for this opportunity to hear Katie speak, to hear how you are speaking through her and this and to each uh, to all of us this morning. God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you this morning. Amen. After reading that scripture, I wanted to dig deeper into the words of this text and the details that I believe highlights that Pentecost is not merely about the event that unfolds between the Holy Spirit, the apostles, and the gifts they are given, but how the text makes clear who will be receiving the Spirit. As we just read, Luke, the author of Acts, gives us this incredible scene of the sound of wind and fire entering into the place the apostles were at. The imagery is meant to spark our imagination. It is vivid because it not only provides an impressive beat to our story, but because it is meant to call our attention back to other instances of wind and fire in the Bible and how these moments reflect and relate to what is happening here at Pentecost. The word used for wind here is the infinitely interesting Greek word pneuma. Pneuma has a few different meanings and uses, but it is commonly used as wind, breath, and spirit. Specifically in the Septuagint, the ancient Greek translation of the Old Testament, pneuma is used for the imagery of the spirit of God hovering above the unformed void of primordial darkness in the second verse of Genesis. Wherever 
pneuma shows up in the Bible, it brings with it this titanic depth of biblical memory and clues us in to what is being communicated here. Something divine is happening. God is moving. And the imagination does not stop with just pneuma and wind, but we are brought back to some of the original revelations by God to Moses and the Israelites at Mount Sinai, where they are given direction on a new way of being in the world. In our story this morning, the imagery brings us to a similar place. The apostles are receiving something new, something that will guide them in bringing a new way of being in this world. As we continue in the story, we find that this new moment is happening. The apostles are filled with the Holy Spirit. The image of pouring water into a garden, bringing new life and energy came to mind. And this results in the apostles being given, like I said, a spiritual gift, the gift of speaking a new language that they did not previously know. They are suddenly filled with this new spiritual energy and gift, but for what reason? Well, this event takes place during the Festival of Weeks, a time when Jewish people from all over the world have come to Jerusalem. They would have spoken many different languages. And you can imagine, if you suddenly heard the familiar sound of your language, it would have been comforting and confusing, but would it, it would have caught your attention immediately. And this is what the text tells us is happening. They speak these new languages so that the people from all over can hear the gospel. But the apostles are dismissed. They are relegated to being drunkards. And I find this very humorous that this is the go-to excuse for the crowd. But Peter pushes back and instead quotes from the prophet Joel. This is not the result of having too much to drink. This is the fulfillment of God's promise that God's spirit will be poured out onto all of us, all flesh, as we read in the text. It is a remarkable moment filled with poignancy and potential. Peter senses the moment and recites the words of his tradition that he sees so clearly taking place in front of him. And this quotation is just filled with draw-dropping ideas. God is pouring out God's spirit onto us we have accessibility directly to God? He claims that sons and daughters will prophesy in the rich biblical tradition of the prophets being the one God speaks through for direction and guidance for the community. The claim that young men shall have visions and old men shall dream dreams that will reveal what God is doing, it primes us for the rest of what the passages coming in Acts such as Peter's visions. But its gendered language does not need to be restrictive. We can move beyond it to recognize the spirit of this text that shows us that God can move through any of us and each of us to dream dreams and see visions. And this level of inclusion does not stop for Peter and the prophet Joel, but continues at the insistence that slaves too will receive the Holy Spirit. An economic class in the ancient world, making up those lowest and most oppressed by society, economically disadvantaged and without freedom. They too will be filled with the Spirit. Peter's use of the prophet Joel reveals to us an inclusive vision for who God pours God's Spirit onto. This sermon by Peter is astounding. And much can be made of the apostles receiving the Holy Spirit, but the real juice is the vision of God being accessible to all of us, that God works and speaks through all of us. If we focus too much on the historical moment and the event itself, we risk losing the primary point, that God claims to be pouring out God's Spirit, not to just a special set of apostles, but onto all of us. And if we don't recognize this important aspect of Pentecost, we risk limiting who we believe God can work and speak through. 
So when we look at this event of Pentecost and we realize its importance in our own access to the Holy Spirit, we must realize that the gifts the Spirit gave the disciples in the moment and the gifts we experience today are not ends in themselves, but they, are, have, they have a general purpose. They communicate the hope of the gospel. Throughout Paul's letters, we get a sense for what these different spiritual gifts can be. While they're not exhaust, exhaustive lists of how the Spirit can work through us, they spark intrigue and wonder at how the Spirit may be moving inside of us. These discussions of spiritual gifts and the way the Spirit has filled us are helpful. However, they sometimes stop at that conversation level. Sometimes the idea of spiritual gifts or the ways we think God may be working through us and others is used for some sort of evidence for our own connection with God. But leaving the conversation at just that level does not live into the vision of Pentecost. The disciples were given the gift of a new language, not to show what was possible for the Spirit, but to communicate. In their instance, it was to communicate the gospel to new people. And it is a similar function for us today. We communicate what God is doing in the world, the hope that God will make all things new, that death has been defeated in the resurrection when we use our gifts. This is how God speaks through us. It's not necessarily verbal. God speaks through us when we provide the gift of presence to someone, when they are going through something unimaginably hard. God speaks through us when we use gifts such as service, when we provide material and spiritual hope to others, communicating, communicating that God has not forgotten them too. Each of us have some, has some sort of spiritual gift, and each of these gifts, when used well, they communicate the gospel, the hope that all things will be made new, the hope of resurrection. But this means we should also be on the lookout for how God may be trying to communicate to us. How might the Spirit use others to communicate to us direction, guidance, and hope in our own lives? Do we prepare ourselves for this type of existence, or do we shut ourselves off from what others and other communities might be saying to us that, that God might be communicating through them. The idea of God's Spirit being poured out onto all of us should remind us that we have the ability to communicate what God is doing in this world, and God can use others to communicate to us, even people, communities, and places that we might not be expecting. And Pentecost and this hope that the Holy Spirit is poured out onto all of us also connects to the deep theological foundation of the Reformed tradition that we as Presbyterians find ourselves a part of. During the Reformation, one of the radical theological developments is called the priesthood of all believers. This doctrine developed by reformers such as Martin Luther and John Calvin pushed back against the idea that only those in special positions could interpret scripture. At the time, only priests ordained by the church had the ability to interpret scripture and provide other ministerial duties, claiming a special privilege above other Christians. But Luther and later Calvin pushed back against this idea and eventually they expanded on the priesthood of all believers and recognized that all Christians have access to God and can have God minister through them. In short, all Christians are priests, and all priests are Christians, as Lather would later put it. For the reformers, it was key that it was understood that all stand equal before God. They still believe that we should be called to certain functions within the church, but the message that all could have access to God was electrifying to those hearing that message during the Reformation. It was radical to consider that one did not need to go through a priest to have access to God. The doctrine of the priesthood of all believers takes notes from the story of Pentecost. And today, we should take to heart the message that both encourage us to understand 
that we too have access to the Holy Spirit, that God works and speaks through us, and that we are participating in a deep and long tradition. So what does it mean for us to take all of this to heart? Well, I started this sermon mentioning how I felt like God was speaking through Katie's story. An assertion that the Holy Spirit was using Katie to communicate vision for the church and encouragement for those who felt excited by Katie's passion. And it brought to mind the story of Pentecost because of how Peter's speech specifically calls out the way young people will prophesy, being the ones that God will speak through. But as I said, Pentecost does not limit itself just to the young, but reminds us that we each are filled with the Spirit, that we each are given gifts to communicate the hope of the gospel. Peter points us specifically to the youngest and eldest in our congregations, those who have energy and excitement and those who have wisdom and the knowledge of how to move through life well. Perhaps reminding us of the communities not always represented or have a voice in the room where decisions get made. God can use and speak through all of us. And it's important that we actively listen, that we make it possible for ourselves to hear clearly what God may be saying to us and not limit others, not limit other communities that we may have written off or even limit ourselves from participating in what God is doing. And this is a responsibility for each of us to take seriously. And it also requires discernment. It's easy for several people to all claim they know where God is calling us, and each of them have a different understanding of what that actually means. So let me offer a lens to which I think can be a wonderful starting place to discern whether God is speaking through someone or not. And that lens is simply the greatest commandment that Jesus gives us, to love God and to love our neighbors. This lens of love helps filter immediately those who claim to use the name of God and their connection to the Spirit for their own gain from those who God is speaking truth through for us in our lives today. So let's live into the promise of Pentecost, that each of us has a connection to the Holy Spirit, that the Spirit can speak through each of us and our gifts and recognize that God may be speaking to us through people we don't always provide opportunities to speak, that we have written off or have never thought to hear from before. When we do that, we recognize the priesthood of all believers and live into the vision that Pentecost provides for us today. Amen. Will you please pray with me? Holy God, we thank you for the ways that you speak through us. We thank you that you've poured your spirit onto all of us and that you work through us in this congregation.